Hi, I'm Sam Fish, and you're listening to The Fish Bowl. Today's guest is Dennis Hayden. Dennis is most known for his work on Murphy's Law with Charles Bronson, Another 48 Hours with Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy, The Man in the Iron Mask with Leonardo DiCaprio and John Malkovich, and probably most famous for his role as Eddie, the last henchman security guard, to be shot by John McClane in the very first Die Hard. Today we'll be talking with Dennis a little bit about all those films. Dennis Hayden on the Fishbowl, welcome. Yes, great to be here. Great to have you on. Now, I'm I'm talking to really one of the best actors in the action film genre industry here on the Fishbowl today. Um, so many great just great action movies um that you know so many in fact that we won't be able to discuss all of them just you know what i what i i guess i would consider the uh the big ones um but uh you know first of all i'd like to, to just ask you um what kind of got you interested in film to begin with well it started at a very early age i was uh Born and raised in Kansas on a pig farm out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I was a big kid. And uh, well, my mother took me into the over to the, the nun's house to uh, introduce me to school when I was like six years old. I walked in the uh, walked in. There were three nuns there, and they they looked at me and they looked at my mom and they looked at me and they said, "Ooh, what a big one!" And uh, I didn't think that things were going to go well after that. So they thought I was too big to play with the other kids. So uh, they didn't give me any recess. So what they did is they made me uh, do these one-man skits. They had these old books of like little plays, one-man skits. So for three recesses a day for the first half of the year, I I did these little plays. And then uh, they said, hey, man, you're a pretty good kid. You can play with the other kids. And So then they... Uh, Christmas was over, and I got to go out and have my first recess with all my buddies. And I just, you know, and I was only four kids in my class, but there was eight, eight, you know, class. We went through one through eight, and then there was a little school on top of the hill where there was two uh, seventh and eighth graders went. And one day it was uh, snowing, and uh, and when it snowed, uh, my mom would always get one of the neighbor ladies that had a car picked up, so we used to just walk. School was only like a mile and three quarters so across pastures. And then, uh, so I'm waiting to get a ride in this snowstorm and I'm sliding down this hill and the eighth graders are there and they're tripping me and I'm laughing and having a good time. I don't care. Well, the next day, the nun reported to the other nuns that I was beating up on the eighth graders and I got no more reset. So <laughs> I went back to doing my one man skits again and then, uh, and then, uh, my brother came home one day was from the city dump and had this TV and he um, he plugged it in and he made one out and made a makeshift antenna and whatever it was. And for the first time we got TV and uh, the Whirly Birds were out. The uh, it was a helicopter show about a couple of policemen and it was the uh, guest from uh, Gunsmoke was the was the star of it whatever it was. And my brother said those people make pretty good money doing that stuff and I said well hell I do that every day it's cool. So that pretty much set me. I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a shot one day. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> so you did, absolutely. <laughs> now, would you say um action films was that like where you originally wanted to get into as far as a genre goes, or did you have or was that kind of like unexpected? Well, yeah, I was just like, they just, I, I take anything that came along. I was doing theater out here for, in California for, when I first got out here, I got into, uh, you know, of course, I had to make a living and all that shit. But, uh, I got into doing a lot of theater, and, you know, I did that for like 10 years before I ever even got into a union or, or anything. So I was just into the whole, you know, the whole gamut of acting, you know. I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was a lot of fun to me, you know what I mean? It wasn't like big stretch or anything or a big stretch but uh so yeah i just said you know i'm a big guy like i said so immediately you know i was too big to 
uh, with a lot of people. So they put me in as the, you know, as the, as the, you know, doing the action stuff, you know. And the casting directors would look at me and go, you're a stuntman, aren't you? And I go, no. And they go, oh, okay. Because they see me in all the action movies and pretty soon they want to put a label on you. That's the trouble with this town. They, everybody wants to label you, you know what I mean? And right. I got, a, I got a pretty stretched gamut, you know, from the man in the iron mask or whatever. You know, I, One day I did a McDonald's commercial that morning and then uh, that night I was shooting, uh, playing that crazy guy in, uh, with Charlie Bronson in, uh, in Murphy's Law. <laughs> you know, it was all the same day. It was like... <laughs> I made a big transformation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Murphy's Law is actually the first on the list to uh, to talk about. Um, but be, but before we get into that, I just want to kind of mention I'm a pretty big guy myself. <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm yeah. six I'm six four. So um, yeah, I, I used to be. I'm shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and uh, and you know, my my friends, you know, all say to me, they're like, you know, Sam, you're you're gonna go out to Hollywood, and like they they all say, you know, we know your writing is like really really good, you know, we know that like you want to be a screenwriter, but they're looking at me, and they, they're they're all saying to me, you know, you we guarantee you, you're gonna go out to Hollywood and get typecast as one of those like psychopath, you know, uh, murderers for like. You know the uh, the horror movies, and, right? Any cast, any casting call for that, your name popped up, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, and I'm thinking like that wouldn't be the worst thing. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a real lot of fun to play. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like you know, you can just give it up. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, all I did was act out um, the shootout scene uh, in, in the police station in the first Terminator. Of course, I was the Terminator. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. Well, we uh, on the farm, you know, we, you know, all we did was play cowboys and Indians and war. You know, my dad came back. My dad had shell shock real bad in World War Two. He's like pretty bad shape, you know. He thought we were Germans. He'd get so bad, he'd try to kill us all the time with butcher knives and stuff. Because he and then he'd wake up the next day, he had no idea what he'd done the night before. Wow. But that went on for. Oh, I don't know all my life until I got cut out of there. Until you know, we take we have to lock him up in the veterans hospital and dry him out, and then that lasts a little while. But it was you know he didn't you know he was really, he was in the front lines for like four years. He drove he was a pat, driver for Patton, so they were everywhere where hell was. He was he was there. You know they'd go in and clean out the area, and make sure it was all safe and everything for the for the you know he was actually his driver. Right, that's crazy. My, uh, my... Yeah, so I got a lot of I, I've learned a lot of a lot of rage at, a, at early early age that I could can rely on if I ever need to pull it out in a scene. There's a scene I did with uh, Stacy Keach and uh, uh, one man. What the heck was that? Oh, uh, and uh, the heck was the name of that movie? It was a TV movie, whatever it is. Oh yeah, I, uh, one man's uh, uh, it, trucker. Uh, so what was, what was the name of that? Uh, one man. I think it's one man's favor. One man's. Oh, one man army. That's another one. One man I, army. I got, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I really. Yeah, I really got to throw out some uh, wild ass rage in that one. I, you know, shit I learned from my dad. You know, I used it in that one. But I, I pulled some of it on Stacy Teach. He gets still haunts. Revenge of the Highway. <laughs> he sticks his. He's gonna shoot you. Yeah, you know, I knock him down the ground. I get. I snap him up and I go, you want some more meat? I mean, I, it's intense. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I said, hey, you know, I got it. I might as well use it once in a while. You know? Right, right. You know, uh, who who are we without what we've learned? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Charlie Bronson, he dug a hole for me uh, to uh, uh, to be in. He didn't want me to be taller than him. <laughs> <laughs> And that that is that is the uh, the transition right there. Let's talk about Murphy's Law. You know what what was it like working with Bronson and and uh, you know be, that's that was like you know the first big um, really right. big action movie. Exactly. Yeah, he was. Uh, you know, he was really. Uh, he was cool. You know, he didn't. He he, he had to dig that hole for all of us to be down in. So he was up on the edge. Yeah, it doesn't know it's a. The gradual in that barn or whatever it was, and 
everything was all cool and everything. I thought, yeah, this guy's all right. You know, he didn't, he never really didn't talk much about anything. Anyway, we were rehearsing a scene or something and there was a, uh, one of the people that were working, there was a night shoot. So somebody probably had to bring their kid to work or something, whatever it was. And he saw that kid over there and he just flipped out. I mean, he started, you know, I mean, like, whoa, changed my whole attitude towards him. <laughs> when a heart beat, I went, well, fuck him, you know. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was a little bit extreme, you know what I mean? He right, just, right. I mean, he, he went off. I mean, he just he went off. It wasn't like he was just concerned or anything like that. He just started screaming and going off, scared the hell out of the kid and everything, you know. And everybody just got like a real bummer over the set at the moment. I said, well, okay, whatever. Wow. I'll be out of here. In two days. I'll be out of here in two days, three. Right. Where, where I could dance. Oh, they had problems with the hell. Yeah, we were we were stuck there for a while. I guess we were there about a week. Whatever it was, they had problems with that helicopter crashing into the barn and stuff. Yeah. Wow, that that's an interesting story, you know, because like I, I've never had a chance to talk to anyone on on the fishbowl um, who you know had worked with Bronson. So that's that's an interesting story. Yeah, that's just that you know. I, that's just what you know. He just happened while I was there, so I said, "Hey, you know." It just it, it happened so fast. It was like you know. He just he went. It reminded me of like uh, you know. You've seen people when they just go nuts. You know what I mean? All for, yeah. for no apparent reason. You see their eyes change, their face change, the whole thing. You go, Gee, what happened? That's how I got out of football. <laughs> 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 no, my coach was that way. He was you know. In Fort Scott, there he killed his kid basically. I mean, you know, ran him to death, and then he was the most strongest, biggest muscle bound dude I ever met. And he left him laying on the field for like three hours while he was trying to kill me. He was he was going back telling me I was running the defense. He'd go half speed, hey, and I'd go, okay, buddy, half speed. And I hear him go in the huddle and call my name. And I call it, tell the guys to hit me full speed. I guess just to see what he could do. But anyway, it didn't work out too well for him. But, uh, and then uh, at the funeral, the other kid, the kid died because he had muscle cramp. And he had put some salt under his tongue and, you know, and gave him a, some water or something, getting him in the shade. He had been all right, but they just left him laying off the field. He was trying to prove a point, I guess. Wow. So then at the funeral, he, uh, funeral, he comes up to me and he goes, hey, you're not going to quit, are you, Hayden? This is with junior college. And I said, no, I never thought about quitting. And I thought he was real humble. So I said, hey, I'm thinking, maybe I could, I wear size 17 shoes. And uh, I was playing football in size 13. My feet were just killing me. And I said, well, maybe I can get some shoes out of this guy. I think he's being humble here, you know. And I said, uh, hey, I said, you know, I could, I, could, I, was, I could play a lot better football if my feet weren't just killing me all the time. I could be that much more agile. I'd shoot the shit. And I said, if you get me some shoes, I'd sure appreciate it. And I said, I'm telling this. He starts back to see his face just changing. He's getting just, his eyes are getting weird. His face is getting, maybe just turning the psycho head. And all of a sudden, he looks at me, and he goes, he just almost screams at me in the church. Goes, what if I buy you a pair of 17s, and then you, and then you quit? What am I going to do with them? And me being a big smart guy, I told him you could shove them up his ass. I wouldn't pump that football <laughs> for a trip like him. He was the last thing on earth. I said, I'm going to Hollywood. This is <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> and that's that's another why... reason why I get out of here. <laughs> And and that's that's why I'm writing a tailgate party massacre. <laughs> exactly. As a matter of fact, I was just home in Kansas. I just got back two weeks ago. We go back to the Paul family reunion. You know, I got five brothers, and we all get together and talk about the war stories of living on that farm, hauling hay and having no money and eating everything. They crawled across the cross crawled across the yard, and they go. They talk about they they're possum. I go, yeah, they're greasy, and you cut them up. <laughs> you eat them. I said, we ate anything that moved out here, you know. Well, we were there was five kids. My sister was a Down syndrome child because my mother got radiated. My dad was just absolutely out of his tree. And my grandpa, he lived there. He home. He came in. He was born there. So we go home every year and and uh, have a good time. Set up some targets, shoot some skeet, tell lies. Bullshit, whatever. I said the first man doesn't have a chance to rest it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's let's talk about Die Hard. <laughs> oh yeah, the 
the number one Christmas movie of all time. Exactly. <laughs> Isn't that something? I've looked it up before I did. The one time it was the number one Christmas movie. And, uh, and uh, that, was a, that, that was a great film. That was a great film. They, I, been... I, got, I, talk, I could talk days on that one because I was on that for three months, you know. Right, I mean, they, they've been playing uh, one through three on the Encore channels like crazy um, the past, like, two months. And I have to say that one and three are just... I, I consider Die Hard and Die Hard with a Vengeance um, really probably the best examples of a straight action movie. Right, right. You know, die, die Hard number one is just. It, it also, I, I really am confident in saying this that it it allowed um, the transition into what we know as ac a lot of action movies today in terms of um, looking at your protagonist as a real person in a in real situations versus. You know something that's just written, um, you know, for the screen. Not right. that not that Die Hard wasn't, but you know, it was it was the portrayal of John McClane by Bruce Willis. You know that um, that allowed you know that that film to just skyrocket into into what we know it is today, and you know all the sequels. And now I even heard that they're uh, they're working on a sixth one. Yeah, I was just reading up on that. That they're going to—that's not going to be a prequel to uh, the first one. They'll have a different actor playing a younger guy playing John McClane as a younger person, it's setting him up to, to when he was a cop and then right before the situation before he gets to L.A. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. I thought it should be that uh, you know they should bring me back because you know I wasn't killed in that movie. You know everybody thinks I was killed, but I had a steel plate in my, my forehead from right. from the war. And when uh, and when he shot me in the head, he just knocked me out, and I got up, and it was all like chaos and shit. And I grabbed that you know like I planned before. And I grabbed an ambulance, and, and, and Mercy did, and got the hell out of there. I went down the Amazon, planning my revenge. <laughs> <laughs> that that I, I'll tell you what I'll write that I'll I'll totally write that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, there's a, a combat radio. I do a lot of uh, combat radio uh, interviews and uh, and I and I fill it in and uh, and I do a lot of charity work with them and stuff like that. And Ethan Dittmeyer, he always promotes that every time I come on the show, man. He always, he promotes that 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 deal that you know that Eddie's still alive, you know. So I figure if we can get it promoted, maybe we can do uh, maybe uh, do seven. I could I could challenge Bruce Willis. Some guy came up uh, yesterday uh, on my Facebook and mentioned the fact that uh, he says I would have liked to have seen a, a battle between Eddie and Bruce at the end of the movie instead of you know the way it ended. So like me and him fighting to the death. I mean that would have been a challenge for him. I, I would love to see that. <laughs> The uh, yeah, that was a that was a pretty interesting. They sent us to uh, to uh, like a, a military training school for two weeks before we started that movie, and uh, we trained with uh, this guy who was trained all the special ops. And he, you know, the reason I know this is because at the end of the uh, training thing, everybody's all there telling him, "Hey, thank you, you know, good job." Da, da, da. And, you know, I'm getting my stuff together to get the hell out of there. And he comes walking up to me and he goes, "Hey, I got to tell you something." And I said, "Yeah, what's that?" He goes, uh, "You know," he said, "I've trained SEAL Team Six, and he goes on and on. He's running off his resume like I've never heard before. And then he says, "You know, of all the people I've uh, I've trained, he goes, uh, you're the best." And I'm 35 years old at the time I looked at him because I was, you know, I was going there and taking out all their targets and stuff and doing somersaults and loading my, reloading my Uzi, you know what I mean? Come up and take out all the targets. You go in the rooms and things pop up and you hit them, you know, all that stuff. And um, it was just cowboy and Indians to me. It was just fun, you know? Right, right. And uh, yeah, then, you know, I, yeah, he asked me if I'd do it for real. I said, no, man, I, you know, I'm just an actor. And then he, uh, as I'm starting to walk off, he, said, hey, there's one more thing I got to tell you. And I said, well, what's that? You know, he's already told me I'm the 
best he's ever trained off at him and think, what's he got out of his mind? He goes, you did this in cowboy boots. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, yeah, that's my character. <laughs> so anyway, I heard him telling this story to Joe Silver up on the set one day. I was behind one of those little flies. I mean, that's all the guy. He just started jumping up and down and pointing at me. And then he went, I heard him telling Joe about, about me, about this. This guy's a real, you know, badass killer, you know, whatever it was. And I'm going, oh, shit, don't be telling producers this shit. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to hear that. So anyway, I was supposed to do the uh, Roadhouse. And then all of a sudden, right after, because they brought Swayze out to the set and everything to meet me and all kinds of stuff. You know, Alan Rickman was pushing me real hard to, to uh, do Roadhouse. And then all of a sudden, they, you know, then anyway, they, they put me in a room with Swayze. I was about a foot and a half taller than him. So the idea that that guy went and told him. And then I got a call later on from these people uh, and these lawyers that wanted me to go do some stuff. Still was after me to go work for this for them to do secret ops shit. And I took a witness, a writer, a friend of mine, with me this meeting just because I, you know, so I, I'd have somebody there with me to, to verify that this was really happening. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, yeah. So anyway, who knows? Maybe it's not a good thing to be so good. <laughs> I drew Jeff Bridges in. I drew Jeff Bridges in. <clears throat> Wild Bill Hickok about him getting it. This he's had the trainer for six, eight months before the movie. Before the movie, uh, training every day, had a pass draw and pass draw. And then they, uh, I'm on the set. And I'm sitting there for a week in the trailer, and we did some stage. A lot of stuff. I did a lot of stuff for that movie. There was a lot of people did a lot of stuff that movie. Never got shows. That movie that came out while Bill when it was at the screening, everybody walked out shaking their head. You know what happened to the great script we all read? And, signed on to do, you know what I mean? Right. They just it got changed so much that it was like uh, you know, nobody nobody recognized it when we walked out of the screen and that was, was for real. But uh the, he had this quick draw just with uh, Jeff Pitches there and uh, and uh, he, he practices and they practice six months before the movie and every time they got a break in between sets and stuff like that, he would uh, did practice some more with this guy and the guy was he was kind of a, you know, Big is the fastest draw in the, you know, in the world or whatever. He got his head top after his title. His walk by me one day, I looked at him, I said, I can have drawing you. And he looked at me like, who in the hell is this guy? <laughs> 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 so anyway, we get ready to do the, do the shoot, and uh, we're getting down to the scene where I got the gunfight. And, uh, the, <clears throat> I mean, this is just like so perfect, you know what I mean? Here I am, so cold, but you know, the fast draw against Wild Bill. You know what I mean? I like, grew up playing Cowboys and Indians, you know what I mean? Right. And, and you know, and you got the whole thing. So, I you know, I want, I want the, the nice rig with the tie down, you know, and, you know, uh, so it's everything is like, everything is like kosher, and the guy has a whole box of, of guns and, and holsters, and I go through and pick out this break down that fits my hand good, and, you know, and I got this great holster to tie down. And I slink it down there where I can get to it real fast. My big long arm. And we get ready to get the scene. You know, I ain't getting no practice. You know, this. You know, these guys have been practicing for six months, and then three months. I didn't give me no practice. So uh, I get to pull the gun out. I twirl, do a twirl, and pop it back in my holster. Yeah, that's pretty good, you know. So. Uh, here we shoot the scene, and uh, the prop guy walks up to me and goes, uh, Walter wants you to wear this one. I look at it. It's one of those like military guns with a real, real long barrel. Yeah. Got a little bitty, little bitty handle on it. I can literally get my pinky finger and the neck, my finger and the neck, but right on, on, the, on the grip, because that's all the room was room for. It was, you know, my finger, my index finger will not go in the trigger. It will not fit in the trigger. It will not fit in there. Got a little bitty hammer on and the barrel's way long, so it's top heavy of the barrel. So, you know, and you, can, and you can't, and there's no grips, you can't make somebody with a little bitty hand. And then the holster is one of those military holsters. It's actually literally had a flap on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like, it was like going into a gunfight like with a derringer in your jeans pocket. Right. And the right. other guy was just, you had to dig down in there and get, you had to dig that thick flap, dig down in there and get the gun. I said, well, what the hell? You know, and, the, and then they, that just kind of pissed me off. I said, what the? 
these people crazy? So I thought, you know, I ain't gonna let this deter me. So uh, I figured it out. So uh, right then and there. So we got ready to do the scene, whatever it was, and I'd been shooting the gun off and then just put, I put it back in the holster. When I put it back in the holster, I didn't really put it in the holster. I just hung it over the edge of the holster. So the handle was sticking completely out of the holster. You know what I mean? Right. And then I dropped my big old arm down in front of it so you couldn't see the gun or the holster. My arm was blocking. So when I got ready to draw, I just pulled my arm up, hooked that handle with my two, my pinky finger and other two, hooked the handle, and I used the thumb to, to, to level the gun. And, you know, and I, and I pulled the hammer back at the same time, I just fanned the trigger all in one motion. And it's just, boom. <clears throat> And then we did this about twice, and then the cinematographer go walks over to Walter, and he goes, Walter, you know, he's out drawing him every time. <laughs> and Walter, this is how cool Walter Hill is. Walter Hill goes, yeah. He says, I see that. Then he said, in real life, since Phil Coe did out drive, but, you know, uh, while Phil took a, the, took aim, and that's, you know, that was the difference between the two. But this was actually the only... In that movie, there's only, Wild Bill Hickok was basically a folklore, you know, da, da, da. there was only one real gunfight. That's the one there where he shot his deputy too with Phil Coe. And he was jealous of Phil Coe because that girl he was with used to be Bill's, one of Bill's girls, whatever it was. And so that's why he picked the fight with, and he picked it right there in town. He ended up shooting his deputy. That was the only witnessed shooting of Wild Bill Hickok, according to Walter Hill's history research. So, uh, but you can see the film, but like, you can see that I outdrawn him. They had to do some special editing to make it look right, you know? Right, you right. Jump. You know, because it's but, like, you know, westerns are also one of my all time favorite uh, genres, you know, and, and, and it's so much that um, I've actually basically combined um, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Pale Rider, High Plains Drifter, and Mad Max into like one, the one like movie script that that I'm that I'm, yeah. I'm working on right now. I grew up watching, you know, we when in the fifties when you know or late fifties when we first got our first TV, whatever it was, uh, you know the like Gunsmoke and uh, you know Rifleman and uh, on and on and off, you know that right. The uh, wagon train, uh, you know, everything was western, you know, basically, it seemed like. So I grew up the same way, you know, I, I, I grew up riding in, you know, all that stuff, too. Breaking horses and having fun. So that, that's, that's the cooler aspect, because you've actually kind of, like, lived, you know, being... being oh, western. I was. My yeah. grandpa was a, was a cowboy, he, uh, you know, uh, he was... Uh, one time he went up to Montana or whatever it was, and uh, he spent a year by himself up there in the woods, building himself a cabin and all this stuff. He was going to do some farming up there. He built it. In the springtime, he said, we were going to go find a town and get some seed and stuff. And he's heading into wherever, wherever there was some people, and he ran across another farmer out there in the middle of nowhere. And he stopped and said, hey, uh, uh, what's this ground good for growing in there? Guy said, Well, he said, I planted some wheat last year, and my grandpa said, Well, how'd it do? And he said, I don't know, it ain't come up yet. So my grandpa just kept riding, and he rode down to Oklahoma and got into Oklahoma land rush. And uh, he had an old horse and a wagon, and uh, and uh, he picked up a friend of his on the road of what to do the Oklahoma land rush, and uh, had that old horse tied behind his wagon, and, uh, and said, They went in the the guy who was with said, hey, man, we can't take that old horse. We'll just slow us down, you know, whatever it is. And uh, and, uh, and uh, so he went to the bar and started bragging about how great this horse was and how fast it was. And I guess somebody stole the horse. And Grandpa said, I wasn't worried. And so we just got out of town. And he said, there was my horse. And whoever stole his horse figured it was faster to get off and run off a piece of land. than it was. <laughs> <laughs> that old horse. He said, we hooked it up to the buckboard. And... Uh, and uh, went and grabbed his, you know, got us some land. <laughs> I think he was quite the character. He was only about five foot two or three. He was a little bitty guy, but he he looked to be 90 somewhere it was. He was actually more my dad than my dad was. He was like, you know, he was sane, you know. 
So I was lucky to have him around. Uh, him around. I made a run to and hide behind when all my brothers were trying to beat me up. You know, he'd, he'd yell at him. He leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, but yeah, um, Bruce is a great Bruce is a great guy to work with too. He's, he he was like, uh, it was such a pleasure to see him every day. It was like you were going to go to see Sam Kennison or somebody at the at the you know the Laugh Factory or something. You know what I mean? It was like he, Bruce. He just always had that smile. I call it a shit eating grin on his face. Like <laughs> he's thinking something funny, no matter what. You know what I mean? Right. And he sometimes we'd have. Uh, uh, well, yeah, one day we, we we had some time to kill. I love to say that time to kill. Bruce would actually get up and do a stand-up comic act. Huh. You know, with just, you know, his cast members and people like that. He would just, he'd actually get going and he would, he would do some funny stuff. One day, the line comes over and I just, I just did, I just finished Action Jackson in it. And, and Joel had seen the, had, the trailer just came in for Action Jackson. He showed it to me uh, when, I, when he asked me to do the art. It had uh, it had uh, the first trailer for that movie that they that, that he had was basically I'd say sixty percent of it was me, and so uh, it looked like I was the star of the movie when I saw the trailer. I thought, well, you know, man, no wonder they want me to do this one, and uh, and uh, so. Uh, uh, Let's see, where was I going with that one there? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So Stallone had been over to the office, and he was trying to do a film with, uh, with Joel, and Joel showed, showed him that trailer. So he comes walking over to the set, and then he wants to meet Bruce and some, you know, and everybody. So Joel brings him over to the set. And the first thing Stallone does, he sees me. I'm laying on the floor, and uh, we had some kind of stage steps or whatever it was. And Bruce was setting to my left or whatever it was and Stone comes in and he looks at me and he looks at me because he thinks he knows me because he just saw me in that in that thing so he looks at me and he goes he goes hey you know he does that Stallone grunt you know whatever it was right. and I, so I just did it I just did it back in my eye and uh and uh and uh and we kind of nodded to one another and he walks on by and Bruce looks over to me and he says Bruce don't know him and Bruce looks over me and goes you you know fly? I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the whole conversation in three grunts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I I uh, I was in, I was uh, I got a big. The reason Die Hard is the way it is is because the end is the way it is. Because of me. Uh, this is a true story. There's this lady named Bobby Marcus. She's a public. Uh, relations person and she uh, had Herbie Hancock and a bunch of musicians that she she did publicity for. She was over on the Butler building in Santa Monica there and uh, a lot of recording uh, facilities there and I had some friends over there who worked doing recordings and, and a friend of mine, Ralph Benton, who knew Bobby, he said, said, hey, you know, I got a friend of mine just doing movie after movie and, uh, you know, you consider doing you uh, consider any actors for, for publicity? And she said, "Well, yeah." She goes, "I've been thinking about that." So I had met and met with her, and and uh, she wanted to know what I'd been up to, whatever it was. And I said, "Oh, by the way, I just got cast in a movie. It's called Die Hard." And she goes, "Whoa!" She goes, "My brother-in-law, Stephen Dezuzu's future brother-in-law, Stephen Dezuzu, is one of the writers of that." And I said, "Really?" I said, that's interesting. I said, uh, well, what if I, uh, I said, I'll tell you what, I said, uh, I said, could you get him to, uh, I get killed about halfway through this movie. I said, is there any way you could, uh, call him and get him to extend that part of mine and make it to the end? I said, if he does, I said, I'll hire you as my publicist. And, uh, she calls me back about a week later and she goes, yeah, he said he could do that. And uh, I hired her for my publicist for about a year, and uh, she didn't really do much. But I figured that was enough right there. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is movie history. <laughs> and the rest is movie history. Nobody knows this. You know, there's these, these things about, you know, under, you know, behind the scenes of movies. Right, you know, right. Like, but that's a true story. You know, I'm not sure she's about to be pissed if she 
if she heard me telling this story, but, but uh, you know, it happened. And so I changed the, I don't, you know, who knows what, how much they changed it. I got the original script, but I can prove it. You know what I mean? Right. I have the original right. script where I get killed, where I get killed halfway through and I have the, all the new pink and blue and green and yellow and whatever pages came along after that, where they changed it all. So I can back up all my stories, you know? Right, right. Because I'm a storyteller. I'm a storyteller son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, is, that is what, you know, the greatest part about having people such as yourself on the fishbowl is hearing all the behind-the-scenes stories of, you know, these awesome movies, you know, especially Die Hard. I mean, like, like we right, said, yeah. you know, Die Hard is, you know, we're, you know I'm Jewish, and uh, my two top favorite um, Christmas movies are, uh, you know, Die Hard and uh, probably um, Jingle All the Way, because <laughs> it's Schwarzenegger. Right. You know? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. You know, but, um, you know, Die Hard is, it's, it's just, it's such a flawless film. I mean, like. I never got to work with Arnie. I always thought, I, I, uh, I thought maybe I could get on with John McTiernan and get a film with him right after Die Hard. But what, I went to, I went down there to the set one day. I you know, so I was in the studio or something. I ran into him and I got to meet him and, uh, and, uh, but uh, I said, man, that'd be, that'd be a fun guy to, Work with. Matter of fact, Joe Silver comes with me and he goes, when I was doing Action Jackson here, and he goes, uh, where were you when I was casting Predator? <laughs> I said, I was in your office reading for you, and that's when they got Jesse Ventura, you know, they, and it really pissed me off. But, you know, like I said, I spend my whole life of doing this stuff from grade school to, to you know, 10 years of theater out here for nothing, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not the money, just for my own then I get all this and going to get into these films and then they go hire some wrestler. You know right. what I mean? Right. He wasn't a fucking actor. He's still not an actor. He'll never be a fucking actor. And, uh, you know, just that kind of shit that they do out here. Piss me off. And then all of a sudden then they start getting rap stars. But Walter Hill was right after I did, I did these movies with rap stars as the bad guys and the big guys. You know, it's like, this. I don't, you know, and I, I mean, I, I could cast these movies in a heartbeat with some badasses I know that come through this town that are actors. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. You know, and they and, they, and they don't hardly use any of them. Like I should be working all the time. You know, you know, I'm good at this shit. I can the cops, everything. You know, just, but you know, just to get a to get an agent, it's a big time agent. You know, you you have to show that you make a certain amount of money. Or, you know, you've got to be on the inside of the in crowd or whatever. It's not, and then they steal all your money anyway out here. Foreign ladies, you know, all the, all the foreign royalties and stuff for Die Hard and all those big action movies were all stolen by the studios. Then the writers, the and the directors, they stole, stole them. And then they said, don't tell the actors, no, the writers and the directors, they stole them. And then they said, don't tell the actors, they about it. That's why I've been in court with these people. Some of my history there that I've got, uh, I'm in court with these people because I know who the players are and who all the, who all the thieves are. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a farm kid. I grew up Paul and May. You know what I mean? I know who was making the bales heavier than they were supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a, it's a you know it's show and then there's business. <laughs> right, right. It's it's the story of the and industry. the business is and the business is you know is, is is actually more important than the show. You know, right. As far as this goes, you know. Show business. <laughs> but anyway, it's fun. This is what I do and uh, it's what I've been doing. Commercial. I've done a lot of commercials. You thank God for commercial. You know, my, my uh, one of my writing teachers is uh, constantly saying to us that um, commercials is, is definitely um, a very viable option for um, screenwriters to get into now because uh, commercials are turning away from just being ads and starting to, to be, you know, short films uh, as commercials. Oh, man, that's about time, you know, because, you know, you know who writes the most those commercials, especially back in the day, I mean, uh, who wrote those commercials? Those are people sitting around the office. They don't have, like, regular writers. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. 
don't know that, don't realize that those are those are ad agency people that are just sitting around going throwing ideas around, like you know, goofy ideas. You know, when you see these commercials, I can I can almost see them sitting there thinking. Like I did uh, one with the uh, the Clydesdales, you know, playing football mm-hmm. for Budweiser, right? And and we went and sh- went up by Mount Whitney and with these beautiful horses and just stuff and shot in the worst of weather. And uh, did this great commercial. And then they did a couple of other commercials. And one of them was called Rock, Paper, Scissors, where they, they, I don't know, he knocks the guy out with a rock or something. You know what I mean? Right. And then they had another one that was even stupider than that one. And they, uh, I guess they put him into a focus group or something. And they, they picked the one that they're going to use. You know, that was, like I said, those, and then, so they didn't pick mine. What it was, they picked the rock, paper, scissors, which only ran once. You know, it's like, I'm going, that's just strange. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's they spend ridiculous. all that money, waste all that money, all that stuff just to, you know. Yeah, like if you had a real writer and wrote something really good, then you go shoot it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it right. You, know? you don't have to shoot five projects and then, you know, and spend a half a million dollars in a focus group or whatever it is per group or anyway. That's just more business. Yeah, it goes with the territory, you know? Yeah. But uh Yeah, I used, I used to do construction. You build houses and apartment buildings and stuff. So this is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should think so, you know. <laughs> it's movies, it's acting, you know. It's 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 uh it's a very it's it's cool, you know. It's what it's what, you know, makes entertainment, you know, in the movies entertainment, you know? And and <laughs> again, you know, they've been playing die hard on the, the uh the encore channels. And in fact, I watched it last night uh, for what probably I consider has to be well over um, the thousandth uh, time that I've seen Die Hard. Um, And it just keeps getting better every time. Yeah, it's like one of those, I'm the same way, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like somewhere in the world every night, you know, I mean, uh, every day, I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'm the same way, you know, I'll be walking by or something and the TV will be on or something. Maybe it'll pop up and I'll, I'll sit there and I'll start, I'll look at a scene, you know, thinking I'll, you know, I got things to do. And next thing you know, here I am an hour later still sitting there watching. watching. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, it's, you know, they taught that in uh, in colleges. It's the perfect screenplay for action film. And uh, I know this for a fact because uh, my ex-wife, who, you know, always tell me I need to get a real job, you know, whatever it was. Well, she's going to college and she had a course in in writing or something or whatever it was. And, they, and that day that she'd said that to me, she went to school and that day the teacher said, open your book to page da 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 And on that page is my picture. <laughs> in, the, in the textbook at school because I've had college kids back I don't, I don't know what's in there anymore or not but I had college kids used to come up to me and want my autograph because they because they studied die hard in, in college and my picture was the, you know, the only picture in the book where no Bruce Wilson it was just me a lone picture of me from the movie whatever it was <laughs> and you know about the uh about the Cleveland show, right? The parody of Die Hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They got a parody of Die Hard called the Cle- uh, called the, the, the Cleveland it's the Cleveland show did a parody. And anyway, they took my character and called him the guy who looks like Huey Lewis. And then they go and hire this is Seth MacFarlane. He goes and hires Huey Lewis to do the voiceover, so I don't make any money on it. And uh, and it was like an inside joke. I, I didn't see the humor in it, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what a shame. Yeah, I, I see, you know, when I saw that episode, I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is funny, but w- where's Dennis? 
Right. They, uh, you know, they when they when the movie Dyer came out, one of the newspapers out here said Jerry Lewis did this excellent job in Die Hard, and immediately all the press just assumed that that was Huey Lewis in that movie. I literally went to I literally went to two agencies to see if I and they, and of course there was a strike right after we finished making the movie for six months, and then when those strikes happen, everything just goes to chaos around here because nobody. The only people that benefit from these strikes are the people who are in place to to benefit from it. You know what I mean? Nobody else right. does, but just a handful of people. You know what I mean? Just in, in a hugely bad way. So anyway, I, that's that's really messed up my career. I was supposed to do Henry Road, Nick Nolte. I was playing Hazel. I was casting, and then they came back and hired Alma Gray after a six month strike. They went because Nick Nolte got got jealous because he realized that I was, you know, could act and uh, he was going to put him up against me and I would say I'm bigger than him, I'm blonde, I'm younger, you know what I mean? Right, at the time. right. So that blew that one. So the strike right after Die Hard did the same thing. And I actually, so I went, went around uh, to some pe- some agencies to see if I could get myself a better agent uh, and, uh, you know, get a, some better work. And, and they literally went, well, no, that was Huey Lewis in that movie. I had two of them actually say that to me. I said, no, that." With me, you know, but it was before it was. I couldn't even convince them. You know, they just didn't want to hear it. That's well, bam. That's hardcore. <laughs> wow. What one more example but, of, of how the industry works sometimes? Yeah, I did. A, I did a 25th uh, anniversary for a magazine uh, uh, a few years ago, whatever it was, and I told them all, "Look, like you like all these great stories and stuff." The guy was going to write. And when he wrote the story, they put a picture of Huey Lewis up front, put me in the background, and talked basically about Huey Lewis. I said, wow, that's cool. Right. <laughs> I, know, I know the guy. You know, that day. I was singing on Tanya Tucker's album, uh, TNT album, When I Die, I May Not Go to Heaven, because Texas is supposed to hire the And, uh, and uh, they kept saying, uh, hey, man, there's a guy down the hall at Studio B. Uh, looks just like you. And I had a beard and long hair. And, uh, so I, I ran into him down the hall later. And, it was, uh, and he had long hair and a beard. And I man, he looked like a mini me. And uh, and uh, he used to have a band called Clover back then, before you and know, whatever it was. So, but it's worked out before. I, I, had a, I did that uh, 84 Olympic Miller Highlight commercial that ran for a year or so. And, uh, and, uh, and when uh, I was in there reading for it, the, uh, the one of the producers got up and said, "You know, he looks like Huey Lewis." And the and the director goes, "Yeah, I like Huey Lewis." And they hired me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I did the first Pace for Connie commercial, the one that ran for ran for twelve years. It was it was this stuff was made in New York City, but the original one was this stuff was made in New Jersey, and the guy who owned the company was from New Jersey. And his buddies from New Jersey kept harassing him about it because he making fun of New Jersey. So it was going to go national. It was just a regional commercial for Texas. And they said, we're going to go national with it. So they called me up and we came back in and revoiced it. This stuff was made in New York City. And then it's still running today. You know, different versions of it. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a, that, something like that. You know, that, that helps an actor along the way. You know what I mean? But you have steady money coming in. Absolutely. You know, and that's what that whole foreign royalty thing was all set up to do by the by the foreign royalty people was set up to for actors to have money coming in from uh, from all their stuff that goes to Europe. And then in the studios and stuff came in from that long stuff. And then and that's what they did. And then they came in and then they sold all and they don't pay a dime. They don't pay any of that. You know? And and then they ignored the fact that all of this action all the 80s and 90s action movies, uh, that's where all the big money was, you know, Europe on these action films. I and mean, of course, we didn't get any of that because they stole it all, you know. And then they sealed the record. So, commercials are good. And then they're ruining that business, too, the commercial businesses. My agent just sent us a letter saying that the commercial businesses, you know, this is a big-time agency, too. And they're saying, hey, man, things are really not, really not, it's not, you know, now they're not sending you out. There's just nothing to send you out for. Right. And now they do is talk about striking 
Yeah, they keep talking to striking up the people who pay. I don't get it. I mean, let's, let's make a deal with these people. This, this striking shit doesn't do anybody any good. <clears throat> so I bet it's, um, it's just not, a, not, the, not the worker bee. <laughs> right, right. You know, we're all, uh, we're all uh, you know, we, you know, gears turning in the, uh, the, the, the big machine. Yeah, it's like, you know, unions and stuff, when they have to start out, they're really a good thing for the people and everything, but then once they get corrupted, then it's, then it's corrupted, you know what I mean? And it's hard to undo all that corruption. Yeah, you know, and I, like, you know, that's talking about, you know, the 80s and 90s action movies, you know, they, they don't make, you know, action movies like, like the 80s and 90s anymore, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed with that because, you know, like, like what I say, more, whatever happened to actually blowing shit up? Right. I'm working with uh, one right now with uh, William Richard, um, my buddy, uh, producing. It's called What Generals Do at Night. And it's about all these. Uh, it's 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 it's, it's, it's going to be a good action film. So uh, you know, keep our fingers crossed on that one. Hey, I'll pay money to see it if you're in it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'd be in it, um, and there'll be a lot of people in it. Jeff Bridges is looking at it right now. He he's he's he oh, hasn't awesome. said no. He's had it for a few weeks, and, and uh, Bill has already did uh, you know did Winter Kills with Jeff, and he did uh, American Success movie with him. So you know they've got a good relationship. So this may just work. You know we may pull this off. We're gonna hey, pull it off. You know, I'm, I'm a, one of those I'm movies that needs movie an action movie that needs to be done. I had yeah. I had a director friend of mine read it, read it, read it, and said it's the best action film he's ever read. So, and uh, that was uh, you know Greg Baxter, who did Action Jackson. Whatever it is. He's a he, he's an action man. He's stuck stuck. He started out in stunt business and stuff and worked his way up. Kind of a great director though. Action Jackson was a fun movie to do too. Speaking of of. Action Jackson, what is what was Carl Weathers like? Uh, he, well, you know, I don't know if we're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carl, I don't know, he had a attitude when, uh, you know, uh, the first day I, they struck me out to the set or whatever it was. Had a limo pick me up, take me out to the set. And they, was, they were already in production, shooting, and, you know, he just kind of like, looked at me like I was threat, you know, because here I am bigger than him. And then, uh, and then, uh, when we were doing that scene, where it was there, one one thing, he kept kicking me in the, kicking me in the nuts, man. And, uh, he didn't have to do that, you know. Like, right, right. You know, it's like, I hit the ground a couple of times, and the director said, let's do this again. He said, I don't think, that, he said, I don't think, that, that didn't look real, was it? It was, and I looked at him. I said, "If it gets any more real than that, I said, I'm going to be kicking somebody back." <laughs> 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 and uh, so, anyway, in in the mornings when I come in, I'd every go good morning. He'd be shaking hands with everybody. I'd stand there, I'd put my hand up, say good morning, call, and he'd drop hand. And then you know, I didn't know if it was because he thought I was a bad guy, he was a good guy, that it was some kind of acting something he was going through. I don't know what it was. But then after the movie was over with, and I was going around the movie set Die Hard, whatever it was, he, uh, he comes come over there, and he, he, you know, he, you know, I was the only person he basically knew. You know. So he's come up to me and act like he was my best friend. Huh. So uh, I have no idea. You know. Had me, had me fool. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's really and interesting. That, <laughs> yeah, that's just just the truth. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure he's probably different. He was different with everybody else. He liked everybody else. I mean, but, yeah. You know, I, you know, I just, you know, I'm just, I was just a big, tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, intimidating dude. You know, don't take shit from nobody. Right, right. I guess it, you know, I guess that kind of rubs off when I walk in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess that's something about us uh us, you know, over six foot two two uh two guys. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like you know, it's not, it's not like we intended. I mean, I could walk it back in the day when I used to drink. I put that thirty years ago, and I did that. Maybe I even put that was because I just I couldn't go into bars or pubs or anytime I walked in, there was always somebody that, that had had a few too many drinks and wanted to challenge me. You know what I mean? Right. I wasn't right. really the right. Kind of, I really wasn't the right guy you wanted to challenge. I grew up, you know, I was a bouncer when I was 15 years old. I was hilltop back home. I could tell all my brothers and my dad as crazy as he was. We, you know, you learn how to defend yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my dad taught me the same thing, you know. He was like, because my, my, I get all my height from my dad. He's he's like 6'3 now. He, he shrunk. <laughs> um. You know, yeah, but, exactly. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know for a fact I beat him in shoe size and in height um, when he was my age, and I, I, to this day, I beat him in shoe size. Um, but yeah, you know, t- tall guys, big dudes. You know, we walk, yeah, we walk in the my, room. My son's about two inch, two inches taller than me, and I still got him in shoe size. He only wears a sixteen, not wear a seven. <laughs> <laughs> these generations seems to get bigger you know yeah. there's some big guys out there there's some big people out there I mean, right now I mean I could buy by 17 shoes I couldn't buy shoes before you know what I mean just couldn't yeah. buy them period yeah you know I, I mean I, I have so much trouble you know I have to go to like a uh, like a specialty um, shoe store to like find what I like yeah you know check out shoebuy.com Shoebuy.com. I I definitely will. And never and never buy during the week. Okay. Only buy on weekends or when they have special sales. They have sales on weekends. They're not twenty okay. percent off. But they will if you wait. You can get enough to thirty or forty percent off, like before Christmas. Stuff like oh that. wow! But they've got a big selection of big shoes for big guys. I, you know, I'm so happy I found them. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I know where I know where I'm shopping for my next pair. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's talk about we I pretty much covered everything except two more films that I wanted to ask you about, which was um Sniper Two and the Race to Witch Mountain remake. Oh yeah. Sniper Two, that was the new uh, that was Craig Bass who directed that guy who directed Action Jacks. So they call me up from Budapest Hungary and say Hey, we want you to come over and do the opening scene with Barringer. I said it's a long way for an opening scene. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> anyway, I thought of Glenn and I flew to uh, Budapest, and uh, and we uh, did that opening scene. Where, of course, I, I had my stuff. You know, you know, I had all my stuff memorized and ready to go, and and Barringer was. Uh, Shows up on the uh, set that morning or whatever it was, and uh, and uh, he's just uh, hung over from, from the night before, or whatever it is. <laughs> he doesn't know his dialogue. Doesn't know his dialogue. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I didn't fly halfway around the world to do a scene with a fucking actor that doesn't have his shit together, whatever it was. So they were having problems with the uh, with this crane shot with this you know, crane that was homemade, homemade crane shot, whatever it was. I mean, the crane was homemade. It wasn't like anything fancy. So they would have problems with it. So anyway, they were working on it. And so we did, we did half the scene or whatever it was. And, you know, I could see it. We didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And so uh, they said, hey, you know, we got to fix this. We got, so we're going to take a break here for 15, 20 minutes. So he started, it's, yeah, it's wearing a jungle. I mean, it's kind of hot humid and, and I'm here they got me in shoes that are telling me that I got shoes don't fit me. And, uh, and, and uh, so when they said, okay, we're going to have big wood burns, but oh, I start, start cutting, you know, he clipped off, it's going to have to take a break, you know, quick. So I looked at him and said, oh, I said, oh, good. I said, this will give us a chance to get our dialogue down. <laughs> 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 he gave me a look like, like, uh, that wasn't too good. But anyway, so he saw the look on my face, like, you know, and he realized that I knew what I was talking about, but he didn't know his shit, and I did, and let's do it. So anyway, so he worked with me, 
And we got down and we uh, and went off without a hitch. You know what I mean? When we shot that scene, we did it like in two or three takes, man. And they were everybody was thinking he was happy and you know, all looked up. I had to like pressure him and everything. You know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's be professional. Right. right. <laughs> this is why he. This is why they pay us. <laughs> so I got to. I probably never work with him again either. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do a one man army, whatever was over in the Philippines. They put me over there to, um, have you ever seen that movie, One Man Army? I have actually. Yeah, I'm telling you, that, in my truck, do, do I do go through some changes in that thing? Oh, yeah. I've had, I read some stuff, articles where they said that I get a movie. If they gave out Academy Awards and B movies, I should get one. <laughs> yeah. For that movie. Yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah. that is an awesome and, movie. Yeah, that's, if, if anybody wants to see, see what what the gamut is on me, uh, is that one? Just, oh yeah, this is a purple heart. Oh man, and you slam dance that. I got the killer scene in slam dance with Tom Hall. That was right after he got his Academy Award for uh, Amadeus, and then he was next in on the slam dance. Right. And uh, they chained me up. They chained me to the chair, and I'm the crazy, I'm the crazed uh, jealous husband, or whatever it is. And, Harry Dean Stanton's in it, and that's a great thing too. That's what, and that was one of the funniest scenes in Sinisco, I tell you. I, I told the director on that one, I said, listen, Wong, what it was, what it was. I said, you, you take this character and you put him in this movie three more times, two times, two more times, three times all you need. I said, I guarantee you have a hit movie. He wouldn't listen to me. And I used to go to the theater when it was running, and uh, it was about third of the way through the movie, and I'd go sit there and I'd pick friends around. I'd say, you want to you you watch a an audience just go from deadpan blah to just screaming, fucking laughing. I said, well, come with me. I'll show you something. I'd just take them in there and that scene would come up and it, it worked every time. There was never an audience that just didn't absolutely just balls out, just start bust up laughing. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, you know, what I, was the I, other movie? You were saying, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I showed that to my friends. Like in, in yeah. every time that that scene, you know, the, the the same reaction. Right. What was the other movie we talked? You said you mentioned. Uh, oh, uh, your list, the but... Race to Witch Mountain remake. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the Rock, man, yes. he's a classic. You know, he's a good guy, and uh, and that was a good that was a good little picture. Uh, uh, I wish I'd have had more, you know, dialogue or anything in that picture. But anyway, we'll look out right now. They kept me on there quite a while. I got a nice paycheck. And, and but The Rock was uh, there, and he was uh, walking through one day where it was, and I didn't see him behind me or something. But somebody said, "Hey, Big D," and they used to call me Big D. And so I turned to the Rock, and then I realized that it, he was talking to The Rock, you know. Dwayne Big D. So uh, right. I just said, Oh, I said I said they used to call me that. But it was, he looked at me and kinda of acknowledged and went on. The next morning I was standing there and I don't know, I was just standing there. Somebody walked up walked by me and slapped me on the back. He said, Good morning, Big D and and he kept on on stride and I looked and it was it was it was Dwayne. <laughs> I said he I said he acknowledged that the old guy, you know, used to be Big D, and he's Big D now, so he, he acknowledged me for it. That was cool, you know, I was like, he didn't have to do that. Right. But he did, you know, he did that, you know, the way he just seemed like the nicest guy, you know what I mean? He was always there, he didn't, when they wanted to, uh, uh, you know, like to set up a shot, you know, he didn't like run off, he'd go, oh, go ahead and like me, I'll just stand here, you know what I mean? But those are the kind of guys I like, to, you know, that really care, because I was, stand there, I, you know, I know they had doubles for you, stuff to light and stuff, but I stand there and let them light me, you know what I mean? Because I'm saying, well, what do I want a guy in here in an Apple Boxer like lighting when I'm going to be the guy that, you know, I want the light to look right on me, not the light to look right on somebody who doesn't even look like me, but you know what I mean? Right, right. Right, so I'll say the same way with, uh, oh, what the hell? This is a guy I was surprised he did that state in there. Did it, uh, Tom Selleck, too, same as Selleck. He, he did the same thing. He'll stay right in there. He don't, he don't run off. He'll run back to the trailer. He'll stay right there and 
on the set, you know, and, you know, if it's a long break or something, you know, you, you let them step your like me, though, you know what I mean? And come yeah. back in and check it. Yeah. But, you know, you can always tell the guys who are really passionate about the, about the work, you know, and everything else and everything that goes on with it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a process of, of everybody. And, uh, and, and, it doesn't take much to screw up a process, you know, attitudes, and, you know, tantrums and things like that, you know, to get a bad vibe going, you know? Right, right. Yeah, they're supposed to be fun, you know? Yeah, exactly, fun. you know? Like sports, you know, you don't go out there and play because you're angry, you go out there and play because it's fun, do you? you know what I mean? Right, <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> awesome, well... Dennis, it is it has been a pleasure having you on the fishbowl. Um, thank you so much again for uh, for agreeing to do the interview. Um, one last question, uh, and it's all right sure. if you can't answer it, um, but I was wondering if you might be able to let the fishbowl uh, listeners uh, know if you have any up and coming projects going on. Projects going on now? Yes, yeah, uh, up and coming projects that you know. Oh, I got a great one. Uh, I just finished with Oh Man, this is yeah, this is re- this is really exciting. Uh, Barry Germanski, uh, a, a play writer, and uh, you know, a writer. He had a couple of uh, shows going off Broadway, and then, then he uh, directed his first movie that he wrote, and it's called A Journey to a Journey. And it's it. This is a great little. Uh, I get to play the all character in it. Too. I play the, the president of a major university, and the the story is kind of like uh, there's this college and it has a journey pro- program. And the journey program is a higher learning program. And all the students for the last you know 100 years have been going to this college because of this higher learning program. And uh, it's for you know, the top students, you know, the top 5% or whatever it is can, you know, apply for this or whatever and try to get in. So they to try to get into the journey program. Well, these kids, they figure it out that the journey program, journey program is bullshit. It doesn't work. And the college knows this journey program doesn't work. It's never worked. It's kind of like a never work, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it, and, but it brings in so much money for the college uh, that you know, they can't get rid of it because it, it would, the college wouldn't exist probably. You know what I mean? Right. So when these kids find, when these kids find out that, that uh, you know, that this is bullshit, they, they, they go up the chain of command to present their case. And, you know, the time they get to me, and I'm the president or whatever it is, you know, then they, you know, they disappear, you know. So I'm like, not a good guy again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, this, uh, I'm not hands-on disappearing this time. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just passed. I just passed the buck. You know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking forward to that, and I think it's going to hit some film festivals, and it's it got the potential to uh, to really take off. It's, it's some of the best uh, best dialogue. You know, that in there, like the Man of the Iron Mask, is some of the best dialogue I've ever got to play with. And, and this year was, uh, this scene I think was five or six pages of just me and, um, and another actor just, you know, battling it out, you know. And it was, it, it, it's really, it was really fun. I mean, it was really fun. I'm looking forward to this one. And as soon as I get a, uh, some clips of it or whatever it is, I'll be putting it on uh, Facebook and I'll get you, you know, some clips of it. Hey, that would be awesome. That would be really awesome. And I think this writer is really intelligent and really fun and really cool. And, and, and uh, I think he's going to turn out to be one, one badass director. And I think he's going to be very Germanski. I think that, that name's going to be around for a long time. Because uh, he's, uh, he's, he's really, really cool. Hey, maybe we'll get him on the fishbowl. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about getting, uh, getting to you, though. Um, matter of fact, I'll recommend him uh, to you on my, from Facebook. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I got some awesome. other people. I got some other people I can do that too for you too that you that you'd really be interested in talking to. Like William Richard would be a great one for you to interview. 
you know, he did winter kills and all that. He was right. uh, false staff and uh, night. Uh, uh, oh, he did, he wrote and produced the Night in Life of Jimmy Reardon for Phoenix, and he was uh, what was the one they did in the Kiana and River. And him all did up in uh, Portland, uh, Long Private Idaho. He played false yeah, staff. And yeah, yeah, and on and on. I mean, and he, you know, he did all he did those early records, those early Richard movies, and he said he just put a whole bunch of books out. He's publishing all of his scripts now in the book uh, onto uh, Amazon right now at the moment. And then we're going to, uh, once we get them up there, then we're going to start, to, we're going to put them all in production and uh, see if we can't get them going to get a backer. And because we've got the, uh, he's got my, my beauty, uh, my beauty, my beast, or I beat, so what's it is. Uh, he's got the graphic novel and he just published the book on Amazon. And, uh, River South, uh, he's from the University of uh, Florida. And he's uh, they just built a wing at Cornell in Florida. He university they just built a wing on the university uh, for his artwork. And he was uh, going through some kind of depression or something from oil paintings and stuff. That he read our screenplay and uh, William Richard screenplay and uh, and uh, and he started drawing. The pictures, and this is the true from the peg and fairy tale of the you know of the real the real story of the Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney version, you know. Right. It has nothing really basically to do with this book, this old book. And uh, so he drew these these drew the whole book. I mean, the whole screenplay, like right? over like three quarters of a million dollars worth of drawings, three hundred seven seven to Bill, and Bill put it together and I got the script and. Yeah. The novel, or on and on and on, everything that Disney's got to do with their stuff. He's already he's building right now, publishing on that at Amazon. Wow! And we're gonna, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's incredible. So yeah, you've got to you've got to interview this guy. He's like he's like one of the he's one of our most intelligent writers and just an all over intelligent human being on this planet. I really, I mean, and his history goes back way back. He wrote, you know, he wrote. Uh, the what the president wrote, and that was uh, uh, stolen, you know, right in the middle of production, and turned into American president by Rob Reiner and, and Eric Sorkin. You know, we got a lawsuit going on that right now too. You know what it was, and he and the in the West Wing, uh, it was called the Executive Wing, and he wrote that, and then and, and Sorkin just you know under, a, you know, took it, and and then, so we got a whole huge lawsuit going down on that, and that, you know they just out and I stole it right out. I mean, he wrote, he writes a lot of this great stuff. So I'll turn you on to him too. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. And I got some uh, websites. I want. I'll send you some links to to blow you away of, of all the evidence of all the crap that's been going on. Some of the stuff I handed to you about United Screen Actors Committee dot net. And, sites like that i'll send you the links to them and you can see all the stuff that i've accumulated yeah the that would be awesome. years all, the, all the shit if anybody ever wanted to write a, a dirty novel about all the crap that goes on in hollywood i already got it on a web page on web pages <laughs> 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 you know that nobody's ever called me to take it down <laughs> and so said, people come up to me and go how in the hell you put all that back i mean i turned into pig and stuff with my uh, Photoshop and stuff like this. So, so you know, how do you do that? And nobody says anything. And I'm doing it to all these super lawyers. They're called super lawyers. They got their own little club. They said, how come nobody's ever threatened you or saying I said, because it's all the truth. I said, the minute they say something, I got them. You know what I mean? The minute they open their mouth, it's over with. Right, it's all right. the truth. All right, man, I'll let you go. I can talk all day. <laughs> Well, you know what? I think we should definitely do a, a follow-up interview um, at a later point. Maybe we can kind of probably, like you said, you can talk all day about Die Hard, so I can do the same. So maybe cool. maybe we'll have a, a strictly um, Die Hard Oh, yeah, that would be episode. fun. That would be fun. We could go through the other whole thing, yeah. Awesome. Definitely. Awesome. Well, well Dennis... Thank you Sam, so much. Sam, you take again. care, buddy. And anytime you need anything, you just let me know. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. All right. Thanks. Great having you on. You too.